good to be back. Welcome to Weather and Climate Chat. This is Monday, October 8th, 2018. Been a couple of weeks since we've recorded one of these. Dr. Davis, uh, welcome to the show. Good to be back. Yeah. I think last time we were talking was about Hurricane Florence. Last time we were talking about Hurricane Florence, and today we're talking about another hurricane. So I, we seem to get... Uh, I, I dig you up every time we have a uh, hurricane coming, I guess. At least that's the way it looks, but really it's not meant to be that way. It's meant to be every week or so, but we've just been vo- both very busy. Yeah, so. Usually if there's a tropical system, I know we'll be recording at some point. <laughs> right, and, and, and making this one all the more uh, special is the fact that uh, this I'm Michael, you're Michael, and the storm out in the Gulf is... Michael. Michael. So there you go. Three Michaels to talk about in the next uh, 15 or so minutes. So let's get right into it. And if I'm not mistaken, next year, the M name is Melissa, and that's my sister's name. Oh, there you go. Okay. So, wow. Good stuff. (laughs) Family connections. Family connections. Family connections for sure. Okay. So, well, first of all, I always like to do a little recap of what we've been through. And um, we're about a, a little over a month into meteorological autumn, about a... 20 or so days into uh, astronomical autumn, and it really hasn't really felt that much like autumn. We've had a couple of shots of fall-like air here or there, but then it kind of just, uh, that ridge kind of sets up over the East Coast, and we get back into unseasonably warm temperatures. Yesterday, Sunday, kind of felt more like August, and the the, 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 the joke on the internet is it's not October anymore, it's October. I don't know if you've seen that. No, I didn't see that. <laughs> yeah, so, so why has it been so warm? And what's interesting is what I noticed, and I sent this to you offline, I'm always chatting with you and bugging you offline, um, is that... It, the first 10 or 11 days of last October were unseasonably ridiculously warm, too. So mm-hmm. two October 1st through 10th or 11th that have been really, really crazy warm. What's going on here? Uh, we've basically been just having a very strong high pressure that's been sitting off the eastern U.S. That's not that uncommon, mm-hmm. especially when you consider the subtropical high that's known as the Bermuda High that typically sits near the island of Bermuda, which mm-hmm. is kind of more off the North Carolina down that way right. uh, direction. But it can fluctuate, moves uh, further north, um, say to New England ways, and that pretty much keeps us in the dry pattern for a while. And just like a stone in the river, pretty much all those low-pressure systems went up and around the stone, in this case the high pressure, and northern Canada got most of the precip. Mm-hmm. So we've we've seen some temperatures uh, yesterday. I would say was a good fifteen degrees above seasonal average. Seasonal average around this time of year, Doctor Davis, what about sixty seven degrees? I believe yeah, upper sixties, upper sixties, sixty seven, sixty eight. And mm-hmm. yesterday we had low eighties. Today a little cooler because we had a little bit of a backdoor uh, cold front come down and also a cloudy easterly flow as we're recording this on Monday. So little cooler, but still humid. That's the other thing I wanted to ask you. And a meteorologist at WNEP in Scranton actually uh, pointed this out. Uh, at least by his calculations, we've had one of the most humid summers uh, since 1970-something. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's got a point. I mean, I don't mind so much, Dr. Davis, when we have heat. Uh, you know, and you get that nice diurnal temperature range of 82 during the day, but you get down into the 50s at night. We haven't had that much this year. I mean, it's been dew points, upper 60s, low 70s, like almost all summer and even into the first few days of fall. Um, I'm getting tired of it. <laughs> so what, well, what's causing all of this this ugly humidity this year? Well, first I will say that water vapor is a greenhouse gas. Right. So that absorbs infrared energy, which the Earth emits the most in. Okay. So that energy is essentially absorbed by the uh, water vapor. So if you have a high amount of water vapor in the atmosphere, your temperatures aren't going to fluctuate very much. Right. So that's why we're not getting really cool at night. Right. Uh, that's actually been noted in the literature that most of the warming's actually occurring with the nighttime temperatures, not so right. much with the daytime noticed that. temperatures. Yeah, yeah. But going back to what we were talking about before with the high-pressure system, pretty much sitting off the eastern U.S., in the northern hemisphere, the flow around a high-pressure system is clockwise. So that flow is pretty much coming in off the Atlantic. So we have this pretty much plume of moisture that keeps coming in, giving us the higher amounts of water vapor in the atmosphere. Furthermore, if we're also warmer, and the planet warms as well, you have a higher capacity to hold water vapor. So that leads to... Uh, greater water vapor content, greater absorption of that infrared energy, warmer temperatures. Mm. And also the heavier amounts of 
precip potential, and right. we were definitely seeing that oh, yeah. <laughs> in uh, July and August. August when we were having 10, 12 inches above normal for some areas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so that that's a little bit of an explanation as to why it's been so, you know, humid, and that kind of does fit in because we also had a ridiculous amount of tropical moisture over the, the summer and early part of the fall as well. And I will say that humidity also factored into the severe weather that we saw last Tuesday with the tornado watch. Yeah, that, I, I was a little surprised by the tornado watch, but uh, actually it was well called for. It didn't really affect this area too much, but... Uh, like from Interstate 80 on north, uh, northeast PA, north central PA, quite a few tornadoes, I believe, were reported. 13. 13, okay. That's, that's the number I saw. Yeah. And they pretty much got set up across that very slow-moving cold front, and the wind flow was pretty much parallel to that front, so most of the storms would be going from a west to east okay. uh, motion. So when they were extending that watch pretty much all the way down to... Uh, Berks County. Yeah. I was like, that seems kind of yeah. far south. Me too. But about 9.30, 10 yeah. o'clock that evening, we had a pretty strong line of storms come through. Right. Associated with the frontal passage itself. Yeah, and I, I know there was even some reports of some small hail in the area as well. So it probably was good to issue that watch, even though fortunately no tornadoes panned out in our neck of the woods. Uh, that was probably a good precaution. And uh, then I saw AccuWeather say that the same number of tornadoes touched down in Pennsylvania on Tuesday than the entire state of Oklahoma this year. <laughs> oh, what a messed up year, Dr. Davis. And Oklahoma is in the heart of Tornado Alley. I know, yeah. Well, and it also seems that when you have these unseasonable warm temperatures on our side of the country, the other side of the country has the total opposite, and they've got a big trough out there, and it's already mm-hmm. snowing in Colorado. So Yeah, the yeah. big trough is uh, pretty much right behind a pretty substantial... Uh, stationary front. There's flood watches pretty much all the way from Texas up to Minnesota, mm-hmm. right along that front. And right behind there, you have a bunch of cold air, and that's where we're going to be getting the snow around mm-hmm. Colorado, Wyoming, uh, Utah area. And then you have some snow that could be in the forecast for upstate uh, Minnesota later in the week. Now, I, I don't make it any secret to my friends that I don't like this kind of weather at all. It's fall. I want cold, crisp. I want apple cider. I want, you know... It, sweatshirts and i'm not happy about this looks like we finally do get a little taste of that trough though later this week fortunately so i'm excited about that however to get there we've got some interesting weather between now and then to talk about and that's where michael plays into some things that's potentially. Right. so let's talk about that so we're recording this on monday it's kind of cloudy kind of grim kind of gray with that front kind of stalled over our area easterly flow blah blah tuesday wednesday of this week again it looks uh like uh a mix of sun and clouds looks very warm, very humid, unseasonably. Uh, meh, you know, as far There's as there's a high, <laughs> a couple of hundred yeah. miles off the New Jersey yeah. coast. So it's almost like a Bermuda-ish type high. So it's going to be, you know, unseasonably warm, low 80s, all that nonsense that I hate. Uh, but then things start to get interesting around uh, later Wednesday and Thursday. Around, and if you'll notice, that high is pretty much drifting south. Drifting south, right? Pretty much creating the avenue for Michael to be going up, pretty much the southern Appalachians. Yeah, now uh, the models tend to be focusing on. I haven't. I haven't looked up the, the official national hurricane track track, but uh, looks like uh, west the western panhandle of Florida at this. The last point. I saw was the Florida panhandle that was supposed okay. to be getting. Uh, let me Michael. just real quick bring up the National Hurricane Center's official track uh, because those are the people that we should pay attention to the most. Um, no, that's that's Leslie. That's another storm out there. Um, yeah, Leslie's just going to be a fish storm out oh, okay. in the middle of the Atlantic. Not, not going to affect us. Okay. Um, here we go. All right, the official track. Okay, so they, they kind of agree with the GFS. Looks like the western panhandle of Florida, and it looks like uh, Wednesday, later morning, early afternoon is when landfall should occur. What are we thinking? They still have it getting into a hurricane? Uh, yeah, they have it listed as M, which I believe is... Major. That? That's a major hurricane. Major hurricane. So they're expecting, I believe, I last I saw was a Category 2, I believe, maybe a 3, a low-tier 3, uh, so upper 2-ish you know, uh, hurricane. Um, let me check that. I'm going to check the wind shear yeah. on this because if it's a very calm environment that right. it's moving into, mm-hmm. that could be pretty much representative of what we're yeah could be seeing. well you know better where to go than i do and the wind shear across the gulf of mexico right now is looking not too favorable for development so i'm okay. not so sure about it entering a calm environment shear wise 
So that would be good news for people that don't want a major that's storm. That's right. Right. Yes. That would be good news because that would tend to tear the storm up a little bit. And that's kind of what Florence went through, too. Uh, what saved the, the Carolinas from, like, a truly devastating hurricane was that she ran into some shear. Yeah, right. right. By the uh, Outer Banks, pretty much. Right. So, okay. So that's potentially good news. So we're looking to maybe around a hurricane or, or a uh, Category 2-ish hurricane, mm-hmm. uh, which still could cause a lot of problems in and of itself now the ocean temperatures just off the florida panhandle are pretty warm right now okay and right around say western cuba where michael currently is located right so the ocean temperatures are pretty warm okay i'm not so sure about the shear though okay so probably it it may get to a hurricane i don't know about a major hurricane at this point. Right now, it is... Well, it is a hurricane now. Okay, it looks like as of 11... Well, I mean, maintaining the hurricane yeah. strength. Yeah, so, so 75 miles, it's a minimal hurricane right now. Um, yeah, so I would say they're, they're, they're probably right taking the middle ground. You, you got the shear, which would li- which would limit strength, but you've got the warm water, which would help strength. So probably going with a strong one, low tier two, maybe a mid tier two would be most likely, which could still cause a, a bunch of problems over the panhandle yeah. maybe a three if everything comes together but yeah. that's i don't really see it at this point okay but still if you're if you know anybody in the panhandle of florida heed warnings also alabama uh of course right there as well too uh the, the, again the storm looks to make landfall right now around uh wednesday lunchtime or so now what happens with michael after he makes landfall our namesake is what you know, kind of would potentially impact our weather, because Michael's going to be making landfall, then going up to around Georgia. Um, we've and got a cold Carolinas. front. Yep, we've got a yes. cold front coming that's through. Right. A pretty, mm-hmm. a pretty strong cold front. One that's finally yes. going to get rid of all this ugly humidity uh, and give us some nice fall-like weather for homecoming this weekend. Uh, how is Michael going to interact with that cold front? Do you think, Doctor Davis? Uh, pretty much going to get absorbed by that cold front. Mm-hmm. And get pushed out to sea probably somewhere between Hatteras, North Carolina, and uh, Delmarva. Yeah, the Euro and the GFS are a little conflicting. The the GFS a little further north off of Virginia Beach. The uh, Euro is like down over the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Thursday night could be wet and windy around us. But it looks like most of the rain from Michael itself would not would necessarily really affect us. Our rain would be more like cold front rain. Would, would, would that, that's say? right. Yeah. yeah. So I don't think we're going to get. But I think that there might be enough energy in the region that right. could cause us to be experiencing. I think everybody r- runs a little scared this year, just based on all the ridiculous amount of rain that we had and the ridiculous mm-hmm. flooding. That you know, this is going to be another. Cat- that's a good point too. Cat- with uh, if it goes over South Carolina and North Carolina, you're already dealing with saturated soil from Florence, right? Which is definitely not a good thing. So, uh, so if you're in that area as well, too, heed warnings at South Carolina and North Carolina. Uh, so what would you say rainfall total for us out of this whole deal from the cold front and the storm? Uh, about an inch, two, maybe three inches in this area? Is that what you would think? Yeah, I would say a couple inches. Okay, a couple inches in this area. Total. Yep. Then we clear out. Uh, looks like we clear out Friday, Friday morning-ish. Uh, Michael heads out to sea. Uh, just scraping uh, New England. Doesn't look like it affects New England in any major sense. And then finally, some much cooler, nice fall-like weather for this weekend. What's the strength of that high that comes down? Uh, 1022? 1022. Yeah. yeah, so that's a very good day. Yeah. Uh, looking this at, nice weekend is brought to you by the letter H. Yeah, so looking at uh, the GFS 2-meter air temperatures around Saturday, early afternoon, 50s. I'm happy about that. Homecoming. So we've got, we've got a nice, crisp homecoming here at KU. Yep. Uh, and it looks like it stays fairly cool through the weekend and uh, about average temperatures for next week. So that's a little bit of a difference from this week when we're so far above average. Um, one thing that we do like to do is uh, also within the show at the end of this segment, uh, talk a little bit about a climate uh, topic of the week. And there was a pretty significant uh, report that came out today, Monday, uh, that's kind of grim, saying that... Uh, the U.S. basically has about another, tw- or not the U.S., the entire world, has basically about another 12 years to get our act together uh, before we have some really possibly irreversible climate repercussions. Talk a little bit about that, Dr. Davis. So they basically said that 
in order to achieve what the Paris Climate Agreement's setting out to do, which is keep temperatures uh, below two degrees Celsius compared to the industrial uh, averages by the year 2050. And basically, we have 12 years or so to do it. Now, that could be somewhat optimistic, I would say, at this point, mm -hmm. because we're not really seeing any real movement on any front climate-wise. Uh, countries are saying that they're going to reduce their carbon emissions, but the pledges that they currently have in place in the Paris Climate Agreement are simply insufficient. You're not going to be able to achieve that two degrees Celsius threshold based on what you currently have. Countries need to get more bold. They need to get more ambitious. They need to really tackle the carbon with authority, I would say, at this point. Right. Now, I will also say that some seasons have had two degrees Celsius and above average already. So we've already exceeded that threshold, if you want to think about that, for the seasons, particularly summer. But we really need to get our act together and really come up with a plan to address climate change because... We're going to have situations developing with refugees moving around. We're already seeing that in the Middle East and even in New Mexico. We're going to be having problems with severe heat. We're going to be having problems with heavy rainfall that we've already been seeing, particularly in the Northeast. And sea level rise. Mm -hmm. They'll be pushing people out of their homes. This is all happening, and we're not choosing to address it. We're instead choosing to ignore it and mm -hmm. keep giving in to the fossil fuel industry. Yep. This is not the way to proceed. If we want to get really serious about our longevity, about our posterity here on this planet, we need to move forward with renewable energies, with companies that want to be innovative and reduce their carbon footprints. And they can't be giving in to these types of fossil fuel industry interests. And here in America, we really need to get our leadership at many levels, state, federal, and so forth, on board and wanting to do something about this. And if they're refusing to do so, then they need to be voted out of office. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Because we do not have time to be dragging our feet right now and we need to be pushing forward on this agenda yeah i mean what, what, what's kind of concerning dr davis is it's, it's pretty much just a very people there really is no gray area here it's a black and white situation that we're going through and uh it's getting to the point now where some parts of the world where lots and lots of people live at this rate that we're going with the the warming that might not even be habitable like within a couple of years to a couple of decades. The That's temperatures right. are just getting too hot. I mean, we're talking highs 120, 130, 140. You just can't live with that kind of temperatures. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if we keep going at the rate that we're going now, there's going to be big chunks of air of, of the world with millions of people that just are not going to be able to survive there. So yes. this is a valid, valid threat. And yeah. a lot of countries have economic interests overseas. Mm -hmm. They have societal interests. And just because climate change doesn't happen at your border doesn't mean it's going to come to you. Mm -hmm. Eventually it will. And if you don't think that it will, you are being very foolish. Okay. Well, you know, we have a, a I, th I think <laughs> that that entire five minute segment there was, you know, you were saying, how, how do we respond to this? I think we as the American people have to respond to this and make sure that we're not mentioning I'm not mentioning parties I'm not mentioning people I'm just saying that we have to vote with 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 our with our minds and think about people that are actually going to help protect us against this kind of stuff that are going to look for greener type energy and not the fossil fuel and uh you know business all the time the businesses of the world yeah. see wind see solar see renewable energies as the wave of the future. Mm -hmm. They do not see that in coal and oil. Mm -hmm. So if the United States wants to continue to back oil and coal, those venture capitalists that are going to be looking to invest in the energy sources that will be driving the economic engines of the future will be going overseas, not here in the United States. Powerful words. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, powerful word to think about. Okay. That's why in the Paris Climate Agreement, you had companies like Google, mm-hmm. Apple, IBM, and so forth that were urging the president to stay in the Paris Climate Agreement. Right. Technically, are we still in the Paris Climate? Yes. I, technically, we still are. What, for we another, still are. For another year, I believe. 2019, I think, was when we were... Officially. Two more years. Two more years. Okay. Because we signed it in 2016. Right. You're, once you sign on, you're good for three years, and then you need to give one-year notice before you leave. Okay. So technically, for now, we still are. Now, the president right now can say that he's pulling out of Paris Climate Agreement, but we are still in it. Okay. Right. Even though he's not doing anything to promote that. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, that's, uh, that's some grim uh, uh, talk right there. But remember, we're not powerless as the American people. We've got a big... Uh, uh, Big day coming up in about a month or so. So vote thinking of the future of the the planet, because without a planet, as I always say, there really is no place to argue all these other issues that we argue about. And if I may, too, add on to that, there was a story in the New York Times recently about with all the floods, with all the wildfires, with all the heat, with all the drought that Mm -hmm. have been occurring, how come no politicians are talking about climate change? That should be the top, the, the main topic. I mean, you'll have people arguing taxes. You'll have people arguing abortion. You'll have people arguing immigration. You'll have people arguing war. But none of that's going to exist to even talk about if we don't have a planet to live on. That's right. So that and should be. And the, 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 the once no, your plan is gone, <laughs> yep. you could. There's no amount of money to, you could pay to get that planet back. Nope. Unless we can find that. that What's that new planet they found? The T, whatever that, that potentially could be Earth-like somewhere. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess we all have to quick hop on. A, you know, billions of people have to quick hop on a space shuttle and move to another planet. Then, which was, would be an exorbitant amount of money. Yeah, and ain't going to happen. So, <laughs> ah. So on that note, on that mm-hmm. cheerful note, Doctor Davis, uh, let's keep it positive and say, you know, just remember when you get out there to vote in about a month, vote for the people that are going to help improve this situation in some way, shape, or form. I would agree. Okay. Not mentioning names, but you know who we're thinking about. All right, Dr. Davis, thank you so much for being a part of this podcast. Let's try to make next time not quite so long. I would agree. Meet in about a week when the temperatures are hopefully nice and cool again. Sounds good. All right, we'll see you then.